Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 27th of April 2022. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP, making final adjustments right to that last moment. Sorry we're a tiny bit late. Anyway, on the show tonight, we have the story of Jodrell Bank with Professor Ian Morrison, G0DMU. We find out how International Marconi Day at Caister went on Saturday. And we find out what on earth this is. But first, it's not often that the club or any of our members really meet, meet national recognition, but this is such an occasion because on Saturday at the RSGB's AGM, our own Steve G0KYA won this award, the Wortley Talbot Trophy, awarded for the most outstanding experimental work in amateur radio. And it was specifically for his 10 metres medium distance propagation via FT8, which was published in Radcom in March 2021. Many congratulations, Steve. We know you weren't there. I mean, the, the AGM was done on streaming online, as you may know anyway, which Tammy and I actually streamed for the RSGB, which is why we couldn't go to Case the Lifeboat, which is where Steve was because he was the organiser. But many congratulations, Steve. You may have seen that picture on Facebook that we put on there on Saturday once it became public. But many congratulations, sincerely, from all of us here at Norfolk Amateur Radio Club. Now... I've got a bit of a plea for you now. We've talked about the AGM coming up, our, our AGM that is, the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club AGM, on the 11th of May for some time. Um, and it's only 11th of May, which sounds a long way away, but it really isn't. And there are only three days left, three days, to get votes and nominations and everything in. Now, a little bit disappointingly, really, our Speaker of the Year, which can be awarded to anybody who gave a talk to the club last year, and believe it or not, last year, because we've been doing everything online there were 36 talks but we only had 14 votes as of yesterday morning 14 people voted which I know isn't representative of the number of people who watch we know that every week we get 60 to 80 people watch live then we get another 40 or 50 people watch on recordings and catch up and things like that so we know that there's more of you out there who've seen the talks and I'm sure you care enough to vote for your favourite one. I'm going to take you through now how to do it. It's really, really easy, but there is another way as well if you don't like to use the technology. So firstly, the link that will, by the way, we'll be putting onto BATC and Facebook as well. But let me just show you what, what happens when you go to the link that's on our Norfolk Amateur Radio Club website or on the newsletter. You get this. This is a live picture. And we're just going to quickly fill it in for you, in fact, live with a sort of dummy vote. This is as easy as it gets. So. All the words at the top is really just saying this is for voting for your Speaker of the Year. You can see that then there's a list of Tammy scrolls down. There's all of the talks that were given last year. It's not every NARC Live, but we, we're not encountering the ones where we did interactive and things like that. This is where we had a guest speaker with us. There are all the talks there. So you select your, your favourite one. Just pick any one at random, Tammy, for the moment, if you would. OK, and now if you go to your first name and you just literally put, you can put, I don't know, Tammy, if you like. Is that my name? <laughs> and then your surname. Of course, on this case, let's just put dummy for demo or something like that. And we'll make sure that we don't count this, this, this vote, because I know you and I both voted separately. And then you're just confirming there that, this, that you're a current NARC member and that you've only voted once. Uh, and if Tammy clicks submit, that is it. Now, that is literally how long it takes to do. It's very easy. It doesn't need any personal information from you, including like your email address or anything like that. We'll sort that. We just need your name and your call sign on there. So we're doing this so that you don't, if you any of you worried about giving Google or whoever, this is actually a Google form, uh, any of your private information, and we know that many of you don't like to do that. Well, you won't be doing it here. You're just giving your name and call sign, which is pretty much sort of public knowledge, really. However, if you don't want to do it that way, you can just drop us an email. You can get the list of the, speak, the talks up on that link and you can just send us your favourite. But please vote because 14 isn't representative of the literally, you know, getting on for 100 people, watch what we do and a bit more with all of those speakers. And it's nice if they get voted 
and we, we can then present an award at our AGM on the 11th of May. But the deadline is three days. Sorry to keep on about this, but <laughs> we have only had 14 votes. So that's why we're asking you to vote. You can do it right now if you like. Just ignore us for a little I've while. Just, on each <clears> of the <throat> feeds, I've just put the, um, just put the link okay. on both of BATC and Facebook. All right. So there you, you can just click on that on your computer. If you're on a computer or a tablet now, you can just click on one of those and vote for your favourite talk of 2021. And when we'll count that, we'll, on the, after the 30th of April at 11.59 that night, we will count the votes. And then at this AGM on the 11th of May, we'll award that prize virtually or if the speaker if it's if it's a norfolk amateur radio club member we can maybe uh, give it personally on that night now as well as the speaker of the year which is very important you can also nominate officers and committee to run your club well we have had nominations for every position so that's not a problem i'm not so worried about that but if you wish to nominate yourself uh, or somebody else you need to get their permission first and we need a, a a proposer and a seconder. Also at the club charity, what charity the club is going to support for its fundraising efforts for this year, for 2022, you can send either of those bits of information to the email address at the bottom, which is the usual one for us, radio at dcpmicro.com. And that also includes if you want to vote for your favourite talk of 2021, and it's on that list, and you'd rather not do it on that online form, then you can also email me there and we'll do it for you and add it, add it to the uh, electronic results, as it were. So please vote. I know it's an annual general meeting and I'm like you when I get the ones from Building Society and things like that. Will you vote? Please vote. I, I ignore them too. But this is your club and these votes really do matter. Thank you. Now, last Saturday, as I mentioned, was International Marconi Day. And for most of the year, the last, say, 10 years, apart from the last two COVID years, Norfolk Amateur Radio Club has activated a station from Caister Lifeboat, where there's a lot of history. Uh, just to remind you, actually, the International Marconi Day, it's a 24-hour uh, amateur radio event. We only normally do it for about six hours. And it celebrates the birth of Marconi, which was on the 25th of April, 1874. And it's always the Saturday closest to that. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Steve G0KYA organised it again for us this year. And we were able to work from Case to Lifeboat Station. I'm sorry about the, the, the bit of the changes of the venue there, but we're very grateful to them, as well as Steve, uh, for organising this. Um, now, we've got some pictures as well, which some of you have sent to us. So first up, I think the pictures, these are of Alfie which is Steve G3 EVA's partner in crime. Partner in crime. I was, going to, I was trying to find the right words that wouldn't offend anybody. And he took these pictures. And what he did also add to this picture was Alfie wasn't quite so excited when he, when he realised that it wasn't a macaroni day. It was Marconi. I think that means he likes his food. I think it does. Most animals do, don't they? So thanks for this, Steve. And Steve took a couple of other pictures in there as well, which is brilliant. There's Steve sitting there on the right. I think that's Malcolm on the key, probably knowing him, yep. I would think. Um, We've got a video here, so let me just play that. Yeah, Roger, yeah, you best uh, go see that about the fire alarm's not good over there uh, if they're going off and uh, could be something other than an alarm. Anyway, I'll just let you say hello to Roger. He stood right here over my shoulder, so uh, just stand by for just a moment. Yeah, hi, Ian. BK3MO, this is Detail Mike with GB0CMS. Good to hear you, Ian. Lovely signal, as usual, of course. And I uh, hope to have a word with you from home station when I get the antennas all fixed in. Uh, I'm in a bit of a mess antenna-wise, but anyway, take care. Nice to hear you, and uh, I look forward to having a longer chat with you um, in, in the near future. VK3MO, GB0CMS. Thanks for giving us a call this morning, and uh, yeah, have fun. Hi, so Ben. Hi. Victor Kilo 3, Mike Oscar, Golf Bravo Charlie, Golf Bravo Zero, Charlie, Mike Sierra, 7-3. Charlie, you're the first man. 
That was great. That was a video that Steve G3EVA took for us. Now we've got some... No, that was, uh, oh, was it? Steve G0KY. Oh, G0KY. I beg your pardon. Sorry. <coughs> um, now this is uh, some pictures and I think one video as well from Andy M0NKR. So similar pictures there. Hopefully you made contact yourselves at home. It was lovely though to see people back together again at an indoor event. It's the first one I think um, since COVID hit that's actually been indoors. We had a Barford event last year, but of course that was all outside. As Mark, G0 TMT. And there's more details. I've noticed that as a gym, G3 LA, lots of people have now, uh, sorry, Steve has written an article as well and put it up, all the stats and picture, uh, details on our website now. It's on the front page of the Norfolk Amateur Radio website. It's a little video. Hello, CQ, CQ, CQ. This is Golf Bravo Zero, Charlie, Mike Sierra. For CQ, 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 Marconi Day. Jimmy Zero, CNS. For CQ, CQ, and this is Red Golf. You can do a multi band version, just to get it there we are, a bit of video, a bit of, hopefully gave you a bit of the idea of the atmosphere. I'm afraid that the room that we were going to use at the venue changed three times, in fact, back to the original one eventually. But uh, many thanks to everybody who supported that event, to so Steve G0KY, for, of course, for organising it, for everybody who turned up to help set up and operate, and, of course, those of you at home who, are, who actually work the station as well. We hope it was uh, enjoyable by everybody. Now, I've got a bit of information now uh, from M Malcolm, G3PDH, about the RSGB Club Championship contest. He says that NARC again won the last SSB session, but were closely chased this time by Sheffield, uh, Sheffield Club, although we did have some regular ops unable to take part. A special note was that Andy M0NKR won the 100 watt section with a great top score, and recent newcomer to these contests, Mark G0TMT, was second in the NARC scores, so particularly well done to both of them. As usual, a great effort from all of the NARC team, resulting in a lead of some 31,500 points over second place Bristol. The next contest in the series is data this coming Thursday evening, I guess that's tomorrow. Uh, any newcomers wishing to give contesting a go, please note that there's a contest net at 9pm BST, British Summertime, every Friday night on 145.250 MHz. So if you need any advice about getting started, just call in for further information. And just a reminder from me as well uh, and from Malcolm uh, that we are running uh, a, a national field day on the first weekend of June this year, but it is on Jubilee weekend and there's lots and lots of activities and we know that's going to take the sort of usual crowd of people who come for that event, a lot of them away. So if you're thinking of coming, we'd love you to support us. Let us know as well. We'll be sending you a bit more information as well near the time, but make sure you ask your station manager. As Malcolm says, that's very important as well. Now, finally, for this little bit of news from the club, uh, we've got this picture from Paul G3 VPT. And this was taken, I believe, by Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. Main Wearing's Elizabeth <coughs> took this picture here. And he said he's doing a bit of slabbing. He does well, doesn't he? Look at that. It's a lot. We just ask you to let us know what you're doing. That looks really busy and hard work as well, Paul. It does look hard work. Thank you very much for sharing it. It's a bit like your garden at the moment, with all the stuff you've done, the, the roots and things that you've yeah. been digging out as well. <laughs> anyway, little people. That's my <coughs> bits of news out of the way. Tammy, over to you for your little, little people. Little people. It's food related again this week. Bumper cars. Oh, are they little carrots? Oh, no, they're... No, they're little sausages. Little frankfurty things. Yeah. Oh, great. Little bumper cars. I wouldn't recommend eating them, though, because they've got staples and people in them. And people in them, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, there we are. Miniature-calendar.com. Little people, new ones every week. I know, and every day, in fact, and Tammy picks one out for us every week. Thanks. That's some really fantastic stuff. Thank you. Hungry now. Yeah. Yeah, we still haven't had a meal yet. We'll have one... Uh, a couple of hours or so, something like that, I think. So keep us in touch with what you've been doing. You can see the sort of thing that people send us in. We'd love to hear from you. We've got a crazy plant to show you in a week or two, um, but we thought we'd we'd, um, we'd leave that to another week. But let us know. Just send it crazy to email plant. to radio at DCP <laughs> micro so I'll show you later. <laughs> at radio at DCP micro We don't want to keep our guest speaker waiting too long. That's the, the truth of it. Because from now... We're going on to what on earth is this? And this is a record breaker. 
see things like this can we have a look at it tammy this we is can. our picture i don't know if our guest ian morrison knows what that is but i'm surprised because i had no idea not that i would always have any idea but i thought this is quite tricky maybe but we've had lots a record number of entries and we're going to try and get through them as quickly as we can so we don't keep our guest speaker <coughs> waiting but we want to acknowledge have, everybody we who's entered. We've just got one, um, one, two on Facebook. Sorry, okay. I couldn't remember the word that I was... We've got Phil G6 AIO, I noticed he said, uh, is it a powder flask? Powder, here we go. A G6 AIO, yes. This is the item of flash powder flask used by old time photographers. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Okay. You'll see why I'm surprised at that in a minute. And I saw another one. Uh, Andy M0 NKR says, what is it? Is it a powder shot flask for a black powder muzzle loader shotgun? Now back to those people who've already entered. Um, this week, what on earth is a powder flask for a flintlock shotgun rifle? So that's Bob G6 PWS. Steve G3 EVA, is the mystery object a powder flask for flintlock guns? Mike G8 EY, this looks like a Victorian British Canadian powder horn too. It was used to contain gunpowder for musket or flintlock weapons. James M0 JGX, I think this week's What on Earth is a gunpowder dispensing device for use on muskets. John M6 JWP, he actually posted this on the Facebook page with a picture. We took it off there quickly, but he, he said, is it a powder flask? Please don't answer it on there. Just drop us an email to this address and, and we'll happily do it. But anyway, that was his entry. Uh, Dave G0 ELJ says this week's item is a powder flask for loading black powder into muzzle loading guns. Paul G4 XBT says, I think this week's mystery object is a black, car, black gun powder holder for old fashioned flintlock pistols or rifles. Uh, Roger, EI8KN or G4NRG, would it be a black powder flask for a rifle or shotgun? John G0MXN says, I believe it's a black powder holder for folding propellant <coughs> into flintlock muskets, rifles and pistols. Tip it down the muzzle, put a wad of powder or cloth in after the powder and ram down with the ramrod, then drop the ball or mini ball down the barrel. Shake a small amount of black powder into the flash pan to prime the weapon. There you go, there's an instruction leaflet there as well. <laughs> uh, Colin M0 GMK, this week's mystery object is a powder flask for storing black powder from muzzle loaded firearms. And Bob GSTU says it's a wild guess. Is this a brass powder horn used for muskets or pistols? Uh, ben 2E0 OMR says, um, I think this week's item is a powder flask. My brother in law Peter had a few when as he had a black powder license and muskets. Victor G3 JMB says, I think it's a powder horn for flintlock guns. Uh, Bruce G4 KZT, um, I think this week's object is either an antique powder flask for a muzzle loaded gun or one very ornate oil can for a sewing machine. <laughs> sewing machine, how did that get through? <clears throat> Doug, 2E0YWP, to me it looks like a powder flask for measuring gunpowder into a musket. Uh, Tony, M0TDK, I think this week's object is a powder horn, although the cap and strap, which is used to close it off and suspend it from the owner's person, is missing, or it could be part of a sewing machine. No, no it's not a part of a sewing machine, okay? <laughs> Roger, G3I, LDI says, it's a gunpowder container I used one of the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> it's essential to keep gunpowder dry or it won't fire. Hence the old saying, keep your powder dry. And I didn't know that. I don't Have you ever heard, heard that, that phrase? saying, no. No, you're not old enough. <laughs> anyway, but that's a really good. Thanks for the education there. John G8CHP looks like a gunpowder flask for priming breech-loaded guns. John 2 e twq My answer for this week is a gunpowder flask or a powder flask. Pete G0FVG. Does this hold gunpowder for filling guns? Henry M0 ZAE says, I think this looks like a powder horn for putting explosive black powder into muscle loaded weapons. Uh, Nev M0 NFY, I think this week's is a gunpowder pouch used to carry the powder and keep it dry and ready to pour down the musket barrel during reloading. Nothing else? You didn't mention. No, you didn't mention a sewing machine. <laughs> oh, see? Uh, Andy G0 SUM says, I believe it's for gunpowder from early self loading black powder. Uh, Paul 2E0 NXL, I think the object is a black powder pouch for loading a musket, rifle or pistol. Julian 2E0 DJR says this week's object is a gunpowder pouch for a flintlock rifle or pistol 
fired a rifle a long time ago, a heck of a kick on the recoil. This is my favourite, the last one. I just read it. Yeah. Bob G7JTZ. He says, it's a powder cast for Paul's gun. Main wearing. <laughs> I know. And they're good friends, of course. And now it may not surprise you to know what this really is. It is it a powder. It was Paul's gun. It was Paul's gun. <laughs> and it's a powder flask. And I'm amazed that all of you got it. And probably for the first time, I think, especially when we've had so many entries, everybody got it right. Mm. And it was intriguing when someone said it also could have been used for the flash gun of a, of a camera. I suppose it's used the same powder, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. In the old days before. We've had another picture as well. Um, I think John sent this, which is actually showing what it had. How to use it, yes, that was good. In, yeah, so, so John G0MXN sent us that picture as well. That was on Pinterest. Is that how you say it? Pinterest? Pinterest. Pin Pinterest. All right. So thanks all of you for entering. We want to give you all a name check for you, Bob taking all the care to enter. Now, we'll see if you're as smart this week though. Um, with no clues or anything like that. What on earth is this? Do you know? Don't put it on Facebook or BATC or anything here. If you know what that is, the smartest thing you can do is send it to radio at dcpmicro.com and we'll reveal all. And of course that picture will be on Facebook and on our website and on the newsletter in the next couple of days. So, nearly there, just to let you know what's happening uh, this week at the club. Uh, we've got the gb 2 rs News on GB3MB on, on Sunday at 7 o'clock. On Monday at half past 7, we've got the Monday Night Net on GB3MB with Tim M1MIT. Still looking for others to run that net, so please volunteer. At half past 8, the ATB to CW Net on 3.543 MHz. And next Wednesday, here on NARC Live... 4th of May, is it May the 4th again, isn't it? May, May the, the 4th. 4th with you. Well, we've got Alan Walkey, W2AEW, and he's going to explain how to use the VNA. Now, if you've seen those little low-cost little things that you could buy for about £50 or so on Amazon and eBay and things, very useful things, but not the easiest of things to use, maybe. And Alan will be here again, he's been here once before, to tell us how to use the Nano VNA. And of course, we like your stories and pictures and everything else before uh, then as well. And of course, our NARC card, which we're happy to send to anybody who would you'd love to send a card to. Radio at dcpmicro.com for everything to do with the show. Now, a bit later than normal, and I'm really sorry, and apologies to our guest. It's so lovely now to meet, though, Professor Ian Morrison, G0 DMU. Hello, Ian. Good evening to you all. Nice to be with you. Lovely to see you as well. Thank you very much for tonight. And I say I'm sorry because of uh, some bumper news and because of a bumper entry job competition, we're a little bit later than we said coming to you. Don't worry. So you're going to tell us now tonight about Jodrell Bank. And uh, what I remember as a kid is it being on the front of a stamp once. And this wondrous it thing. And it was a just, yellow stamp, if my memory's right. I think, yeah. I, I, I'd forgotten that bit, but I think you're right. And it was so intriguing for me as a kid to know about this thing and this radio telescope, whatever that meant. And it was only years later that I understood. But you're going to tell us the whole story about John Bank. So we'll hand it straight over to you. And of course, as always, to everybody at home, you can ask questions and make comments uh, to Ian at any time during the talk and we'll read them out to him later. But Ian, over to you. That's fine. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, you can see I'm a diesel multiple unit. <laughs> Ironically, there's so much difficulty in getting coal now for the heritage railways that I love so much that they're having to use DMUs quite a lot. So that's quite appropriate. Anyway, I'm now, I think, in my 57th year at Joggle Bank. I've been retired for about 10, I think, 10 years. Um, I'm still on the books. They just forget to pay me anymore. Anyway, let's start at the beginning and see how we get on. The story actually starts at a place called Staxon Wold, which is above in the hills above Scarborough. Bernard Lovell was studying cosmic rays at the University of Manchester and was called up not to go and fight, but to help develop radar. And he was sent here just before the Second World War started and really to learn a bit about what goes on. And he was there the morning that war began. And he could see echoes on the radar screen and got quite perturbed because no one seemed to take any notice. He said, why aren't you scrambling any fighters? They said, well, they are echoes, but they are not aircraft. We do not know what causes them. 
we call them sporadics because they come and go a bit. Sometimes there's quite a lot, sometimes very few. Well, he knew there was a way in which a high energy cosmic ray could give rise to a shower of electrons that could reflect radio waves. So he wondered whether radar might be a method of detecting cosmic rays. So we'll come to that. Well, they're called sporadic echoes, and essentially that's the origin of the Joggle Bank Observatory. When the war ended, or perhaps slightly before, he acquired some ex-army radar equipment, and he set it up, first of all, outside the university in Oxford Road, Manchester. It was totally useless because in those days, trams trundled up and down, the type where you have a sort of an arm and a hook on top of a wire, and that causes lots of sparks, so the amount of interference was disastrous. He found out that about 20 miles south of Manchester, the botanic um, department, botany department, had a field where they were actually doing some crop trials, two wooden huts there, and Lovell got permission to bring his uh, transmitting system and his receiver, that's the receiver I think there, in that field along with a diesel generator. It was very cold apparently, it took them a day or so to defreeze all the diesel, but they got their first echoes on the 14th of December. And just notice the little sapling over on the left here. We'll see that gradually get a bit bigger over the time. Now, that was a very serendipitous event because that happened to be the night of the German meteor shower. And that's a lovely photograph someone's made of all the German meteors. So they got lots and lots of echoes. And it wasn't too long before they realized there were nothing to do with cosmic rays but were in fact caused by the little uh, lines of uh, excited electrons, little plasma left behind as a, a little meteor comes into the atmosphere and uh, it causes um, the effect of reflection. So that's what in fact they had discovered. It wasn't what they were wanting to observe, but it was interesting and they decided we'd carry on and learn all about meteors. Well, that went quite well and the university uh, acquired the next field. In fact, if my point is working, the first observations were down to the lower right here. But this was then Joggle Bank as it was in the very early days. This was a little power station, our powerhouse with diesel generators. And we're going to zoom in a little bit, uh, a little bit later, um, shortly. It's on the road south from a place called uh, Wimslow down to Holmes Chapel, which is actually on the, the M6 motorway but my friends who live there call it Homs Chapel because it's actually slightly posher. But why is it called Jodrell Bank? Well, right up at the top right, it's not obvious, but there's actually quite a depression. You go down and up. You go down from there. And down here is a sand quarry. And it's called Dane Bank Quarry. Sorry, Dane Bank Quarry. Now, the bank is an interesting word. As you come round past Jodrell, it's all flat here, just down the bottom here, you go down and up again, and that's called Jodrell Bank. A bank, in fact, in Cheshire, is where a little stream or river has worn away the Cheshire Plain, giving you this sort of little uh, dip in, 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 in the ground. So that's why it's called Jodrell Bank. The hamlet was called Jodrell Bank. Sorry, gone the wrong way. Um, we're zooming in here. And this is how it was in its fairly early years. Um, I'm going to come back to this little antenna here. It's actually called a searchlight antenna. And you can see there's a nice array of Yagis on there. So that's quite good. That's the powerhouse again. But what you can't see, but it's there, was in fact what was then the world's largest radio telescope, 218 feet across. And the reason why you can't see it is because the surface was made of a wire mesh. It's actually here. And the radio waves coming from above were reflected up to their little feed, which collects the radio waves and cables bring them down to receivers in the hut here and the laboratory there. And that's a picture of Lovell, I think, on the day that he was made a professor of radio astronomy with some of his staff, some of whom were still there when I became a young student. And uh, an interesting point here, though, is that this is Dr. Tom Kaiser. Now, he was known to have... Um, Russian sympathies. And in fact, some of the staff were having Russian lessons in the room above the bar at the Red Lion Inn in Goose Street. It was thought he might have been a Russian spy. So this chap here called Ian Brown was doing a PhD, but he was also 
an MI5 agent keeping an eye on Tom Kaiser. Looking back again, we can see that antenna, and uh, I'm going to zoom into it a bit there. Now, you might say, what is the point of having an antenna looking straight up? But of course, as the Earth rotates, a strip of sky passes overhead. So on one day, you actually observe one strip of sky all the way around. And here you can see the mass has been tilted a bit. And that meant you could look at another strip of sky, and another, and another, and another. So over time, you could build up a crude radio map of the sky, not a vast map, perhaps about 30 degrees wide, roughly overhead at Joggle Bank. And that made some very nice discoveries. But here is a rather nice view. It shows that antenna. It's on its side. You can perhaps see it there. There was a new mast by then, and it's a much more solid one. And that was at an angle because they were obviously changing the feed. That's the powerhouse. Um, that is, those are the two little wooden huts. In fact, that sapling is now a bush. And now it, in fact, is something that completely envelops that hut. You can barely see that hut at all. The little optical telescope here, I used to use an 18-inch telescope. I used to look at when I was a student. And notice a little dish down here. We'll come back to one later. That one's a fully steerable dish. It could rotate round and round in azimuth, we say, on that central bearing. And from here and here, it could be tilted up and down in elevation. So it could actually look at any point in the sky and, in principle, track some of them, an object as it moved across the sky. And that means you can integrate for longer. Well, they made some nice discoveries. They discovered the radio mission of what was called Tycho Supernova, 1572. You cannot see any evidence of it at all optically, but it actually shines quite brightly in the radio. And we picked that up way back um, in the uh, early 50s. And also, they were able to make a crude radio map of the Andromeda galaxy. That means it wasn't very, very precise. But it was important because it showed that we could actually detect radio waves from objects beyond our own Milky Way galaxy. And that's what we do a lot of the time at Joggle Bank these days. Well, Lovell realized if only he had a telescope at least that large that could look all around the sky, it would be a fantastic thing to, to use. And he commissioned Charles' husband, who was a bridge designer in Sheffield, to design what was to become known as the Mark I radio telescope. As you can see there, the initial dish surface was going to be a wire mesh, so the backing structure was very light. However, for various reasons, one of which I suspect was military, they wanted to make the telescope work at shorter wavelengths, and so the dish became steel, and that meant the backing structure had to be a lot more, um, in, well, a, a lot more steel had to be involved, so the weight went up quite a bit. And I think that showed up a flaw in the original design, as we shall see. There, they're actually laying one of the railway tracks, the outer railway track, around which the telescope will rotate in azimuth. That's the central bearing. This is one of the two towers uh, which support the dish. At the top of this is basically a very big bearing. It's about two feet across. And then there's a cone that comes out to this part here, which has got a big rack around it. So obviously, you can rotate it by putting gears onto the rack. And that was used to support and, and connect with the with this structure. Um, these two racks were, in fact, second-hand. They came from Rossi Dockyard, and they came, there were 15 and a half inch gun turret mountings for, obviously, I think a couple of uh, World War I battleships that were being dismantled there. And if you can imagine it, trying to move round a heavy gun in azimuth is not that dissimilar to having to move up and down a large dish. And there you see it in the course of construction. And these are two of the four driven bogies. There are two on each side. You can see the motor here. And that is used to, they are used to drive it in azimuth. And that's just another picture showing the construction. And here, looking down from above, you can actually see the circular railway track here. And in the center of the bowl, which is gradually being covered with steel plates, is in fact the focus um, tower. And the focus box is going to sit at the top here, in which we put our uh, feed, our feed below it, and our amplifiers within it. And then cables bring those signals down into the two towers. And originally, a lot of the receiver systems were in the two towers, but now, of course, we bring them down and we have our receiver rooms in the control um, area, which is down here. 
Some of you may know of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster, where in actually steady winds, the bridge began to oscillate and then break up. Lovell gave a talk about the Mark I telescope at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. And afterwards, one of the people there came to him and said, um, Dr. Dr. Lovell, have you put a model of your telescope in a wind tunnel? And Lovell said, no. He said, well, I think you ought to. They made a 10-foot diameter model. They put it in a wind tunnel. It survived for about five minutes. Essentially, they were trying to control the movement of the bowl from the very center. It's a bit like if I had a long uh, stick, a pole, and I try and move it with two fingers just in the middle, I've got very little control. And the thing could start oscillating. On the other hand, if I hold it at each end, I've got lots of control. So they had, in fact, to add a semicircular wheel girder. You can actually see it here, which had friction to stop the telescope oscillating. And that is, in fact, Lovell and husband there. And this was, in fact, the, the clerk of works to do with the building. It's a lovely view, in fact, of the telescope, basically as it was completed, looking straight up. And that's taken, in fact, from that original um, telescope which is here, which actually has been extensively rebuilt. It's much more solid than it used to be. Um, this is called the Moon Hut, where I spent many years. We, we might mention a bit of that later on. Um, and can you see over here that same little dish? And you can see that the, the Mark I is just really a larger version of that, isn't it? I think Lovell probably took husband to about there and said, look, I want one of these, but much, much bigger. And I'm going to go ahead in time quite a bit, because can you just see the arc? of what was the 50-foot telescope here. We used that to track all of the Apollo missions. And this is the track we had. It's a Doppler track showing the eagle, Apollo 11, landing on the lunar surface. It's coming down under computer control, and its speed relative to us is reducing this. It's a nice curve here. But Armstrong, who was piloting it, saw that they were about to land in a crater. He took manual control, essentially lifted the craft up a bit, that's that little kink here, and then basically wiggled across the surface until they landed there. And I think that was pretty good proof that the actual Apollo 11 did land on the lunar surface. And in fact, in a, in a television program produced by Canadian television, I described just what I've said to you, intercut with Buzz Aldrin, saying what in fact was going on. And it fitted like a glove. Now, this is how the original control room looked. It had some lovely displays. This was a hybrid analog, uh, uh, analog mechanical computer over here. And basically, on the control desk, you put in the source you wished it to observe in the sky. And this calculated where the telescope had to point and follow it around the sky. But there was a fundamental problem. The engineers who were commissioning this computer system walked off site. They were not being paid. Husband was about to serve a writ on Lovell for not paying his fees. And I heard not that long ago that the university were about to convene a meeting where he would be sacked. But happily, we were saved. And we were saved by the launch of Sputnik 1. In fact, uh, the telescope first moved uh, on October the 1st, 57, and it was only a few days later that the Russians launched Sputnik 1. Now, the military were very keen to know if you could detect rockets by radar to make an early warning radar system. And so words must have gone out from the Ministry of Defense. The engineers came back. The system was commissioned in double quick time. A powerful transmitter was brought to the telescope. And essentially, we had them at 120 and 36 megahertz transmitters. And on the 12th of October, we detected a third stage rocket that had put Sputnik into orbit, which was actually following Sputnik across the Lake District. And I think this picture shows Lovell showing the um, echo to the press. And this showed, in fact, in the UK, we had something that was unique in the world. And instead of being a bit of a white elephant and the press were very much against it for a long time, it was shown to be, in fact, quite a useful asset. And we used it quite a bit in those early days for what we might call space tracking, because it was basically the one telescope in the world that could do that. Uh, we tracked Luna 2 down to the surface of the moon, 
and saw it impact, or at least we saw the signal stop. And the Russians let us know everything that they were doing and the frequencies we should pick things up at and when. And this was, this was largely so that we could prove to the Americans that the Russians were doing what they said they were doing. We also were asked to help the Americans. They didn't have any big dishes either. And they built this enclave, which I think you might just see there. This is, this is our control room and laboratories. That's their enclave. Um, they bought a lot of equipment in a very big Pantechnicon van, and you can see it actually arriving here. Now, on the side, it said, US Air Force, Project Able, Jodrell Bank. And that was seen by a journalist, by chance, of the Manchester Guardian. That's what it was in those days. So the secret was out. And we were besieged by the press somewhat. Now, happily for Lovell, in fact, the very first uh, rocket that the Americans launched that we were meant to control uh, blew up just above the launch pad. He was quite pleased because he wanted to go and play cricket. He was the captain of the Chelford cricket team just up the road from Jockwell Bank. The second one was successful. It didn't quite get to the moon. They hoped it would hit the moon. But it had on board a magnetometer uh, designed by someone called Van Allen. And it detected what we now know as the Van Allen belt. And we, we basically commanded all the separation of the stages and received the telemetry um, from the science instrument. So that was really rather nice. That's some of the first, I think that's probably the first ast um, astronomy or, or physical results made by any spacecraft. I joined Joggle Bank in the autumn of 1965, and I was given a horrendous uh, project, which was to help design and build an aperture synthesis radar to study the surface of the moon. And we did manage to do that eventually. It took a long time. However, the following February, the Russians soft landed Luna 9 on the surface. And that's a picture of it there, probably in the lab before it went. And we were able to pick up the signals that it was transmitting back. And it was realized that they were the type of signal that were being used by newspapers, etc., to send pictures around the world using what's called a Muirfax machine. Essentially, as the signal came in, a, a stylus moved back and forth over a, a photographic plate, electrically exposing it. And then you had to process that plate to get your picture. Well, we didn't have one of those. The Daily Express, however, brought one out to Joggle Bank with a technician to operate it, and we set it up. And when the next signals came, it whirred away, and in synchronism, it began to expose a photographic plate. Now, all the important people were up in the control room, the room that I showed you just now. But myself, the technician, and in fact, another lady, apparently, um, were down in the sub-basement where the Muirfax machine was. Now, my, photog my hobby then and now is photography. And I actually helped the technician process the photographic plate. And so this was it. He and I were the first two people in the Western world to know what the surface of the moon looked like. And I think, you know, when you're 21, that was quite exciting. Um, I went home and in, in the morning, my wife brought me a cup of tea and the Daily Express, which had this picture quite large on the front cover. You know, the Express brings to the moon. And I realized there was actually something wrong with it. And I rushed into Jodrell Bank and said, Sir Bernard. No, probably wasn't Sir Bernard then, but anyway, uh, he might have been. Um, our picture is wrong. We had to stretch it out sideways by about 40%. They've used an anamorphic lens. He said, I know, Morrison, the Russians have just told us. But at least I was right. And it may be that's why I'm still there. I don't know. He might have said, well, this guy can't be too thick. So perhaps we'll employ him someday. Um, we don't really do that very much now. Uh, we have been asked by NASA to search for missing spacecraft at Mars. Neither were we able to find. More interestingly and recently, in fact, I was um, a very minor project scientists in a way, on the Beagle 2 mission. Now these have very little power. It was meant to land on, uh, New, uh, on Christmas Day 2003 and normally it would transmit a weak signal up to a mother craft orbiting Mars which would then relay the signals back to Earth. Of course they were dead keen to know it had arrived safely and it was going to be about five or six days before the mothership Mars Express would be in the right position to detect its signals. 
So I was asked at Joggle Bank to set up a system using the Lovell telescope to directly pick up its signals from the moon's surface. And theoretically, that is something we can do quite easily. Uh, the Lovell telescope, in its shape, its type, is the best in the world for observing at relatively low frequencies, like 408 or so megahertz. It was due to land on Christmas Day, as I said, 2003. We were there very early in the morning. We could see Mars. It was actually clear. Perhaps you can just see Mars up here. And um, we had a very nice display, which I'll quickly demonstrate. This is frequency. It's like going across the, the FM band or one of the, one of the radio amateur bands, for that matter. Up here is time. It may be some of you have receivers that show these waterfall displays. Um, I think you can see there's a vertical line there. That basically, and there's another one there, these are signals that stay at the same frequency and they're basically on the ground, probably local interference. But I think there, sorry if I can get my mouse going, you might just see a curve, quite rapidly changing frequency, the Doppler shift. That's actually an Earth orbiting satellite. And you might just pick out a line up here, gradually changing frequency. That's actually orbiting the sun. This was an incredibly sensitive system. We'd actually built the receiver using some high temperature superconducting filters to try and cut out all the rubbish from the ground and just pick up little beagles. And it should have been up there in the middle, loud and clear, but as you can see, nothing was seen. We tried for quite a, a long time, about a month in all, looking for it, but no luck. Um, some years later, it was found by an orbiting spacecraft, or photographically found, and it was seen that two of the solar panels one of them should have been here, and one there had not managed to open out. It actually had landed safely in one piece, but hadn't quite worked. Isn't that sad? The saddest thing of all is that Colin Pidger, Pillinger, Professor Colin Pillinger, whose baby this was really, had died just a few months earlier. He never knew that Beagle had landed safely on, the, on Mars. Now some astronomy. Some of the best work that the telescope did in its early days was when it was linked to a small 35-foot portable telescope, you can see it there, which we towed around the country. The signals it picked up were sent back to Joggle Bank by a microwave radio link, you can see there, and combined with those of the Mark I telescope. Now, gradually, by moving them further and further apart, we could calculate the size of the radio objects that we were observing. And at that time, there was a catalogue of about 300, it's called the third Cambridge catalogue. And we discovered that seven of these had so small angular sizes, less than one arc second, that on a photographic plate, they would look like a star, because the atmosphere in those days, you can get better nowadays, but in those days, the atmosphere would limit stellar images to about two arc seconds across. It was thought probably that they were rather interesting stars in our own Milky Way galaxy, but nobody quite knew. This was when we found the position, precise position of one of these, 3C273. And you can see from that picture taken with the Hale telescope, the world's biggest at the time, it looks like a star, except there's a jet coming out here. And by that time, we also had a radio image showing there's a very bright core, which would be right in the center here, and the jet. Well, because these have very, very bright cores, and they look like stars, they were given the name Quasar, you must have heard of that, a quasi-stellar object, a quasar. Martin Smith in America took the spectra of 3C273 and for a long time could not understand it until he realized that the hydron lines, H, delta, gamma, and beta, which are actually in the, in, in, there, have been shifted by a vast amount. It showed that 3C273 was about 2,500 light years away. Andromeda galaxy is two and a half minutes, sorry, two, two and a half million light years away, uh, and this is two and a half thousand million light years away. It is very bright. In fact, I have a 12-inch telescope. Uh, I'm, I do a lot of amateur uh, astrophotography, and I can observe it from my back garden. Now, because it was so bright, but so far away, it gave us a problem. Where did the energy come from? Nuclear fusion that powers our sun wouldn't be enough. And it was surmised it might be due to the fact that there was matter in falling towards a very massive black hole. In doing so, in fact, at least 
10% and quite often 30% of the mass of the matter falling into the black hole is converted into energy and that can produce these jets. So this in fact is the quasar and it gave us the idea that we'd have perhaps supermassive black holes at the heart of these objects. And that's, we now know this to be the case. And in fact, um, a couple of years ago, um, an array of telescopes across the world was able to image the shadow of a black hole at the heart of um, the galaxy Virgo A. So that was a nice prediction, I think. Well, by the late 60s, the steelwork, particularly at the top of the towers here, was showing signs of uh, corrosion, metal fatigue. And so they built the telescope, or rebuilt it, to become the Mark 1A. They added two big semicircular girders here to take quite a bit of the weight of the bowl. But the thing had to be balanced about the center of gravity, about the rotation axis. And so they had to put another surface on here, which actually was shallower, and that made it more efficient but more open to interference. And that became the Mark 1A. It was a pretty horrible name. And on its 30th birthday, we renamed it the Lovell Telescope. And let me just mention this little hut here, called the Marconi Hut. We've now moved it to about there. Uh, Marconi, Marconi uh, you were celebrating its day, weren't you, just this last Saturday? Mm. Well, they didn't just make radios, they make radar transmitters. And for some years, that telescope was the UK's early warning radar. And I believe that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was looking horizontally towards Lithuania, which is where our spies said, correctly as it happened, that the ICBMs aimed at the UK were located. So we did play a little bit of a role in the defense of the realm. Well, the parabolic surface reflects the radio waves to a focus. This is just below the focus box. You might not see it, the little black thing just says the feed the signals then go into the receiver room, uh, or the little receiver. It's only a box. It's not that enormous. You can stand up in it just about. And there we have our receivers. And they're not very big now. Um, the actual receiver is about six centimeters, perhaps four centimeters in size. It uses some very, very clever transistors. They're not vastly better than the transistors used in the receivers um, for satellite um, television, for example. Uh, and they can you can get for about 10 pounds. Um, our receiver in total cost about 20,000 and that is because to make them work really well we actually put them inside a cryostat and we have pressurized helium which is expanded to cool and we get the temperature in here somewhere between 10 and 15 Kelvin it depends upon the size of, of the receiver system we're building and a slightly sad thing now is that the latest receivers we've had for quite a few years now are about as good as the laws of physics allow you to make we can't really do any better. In the past, we've always improved the performance of our telescopes by making the receivers better. Well, after that telescope was rebuilt, Lovell said, what can we do with it? And uh, Dennis Wall said, let's make a survey of the region around the plough in the Northern Hemisphere. And in that survey, they discovered what looked like a little peanut. You can perhaps just see here, slightly bluish in colour, and that implies that they're quasars, they're very distant objects and, and they, 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 they shine a bit in the blue. Well, what was it? Well, when photographs were taken by the Hale telescope and a couple of other ones, it was seen there were actually three objects there. Now, the top one and the bottom, you can see have got spikes. And those are called diffraction spikes, and they're caused by what's called a spider that holds the secondary mirror of the telescopes. And I've got a couple of telescopes which have got spiders, and the spikes can look quite pretty in fact. Now this one here is actually reddish. These were blue, this is reddish, and it doesn't show spikes. It's more diffuse. These are point-like objects. It's actually a galaxy. It's about halfway between the distant galaxies and ourselves. But when they looked at the spectra, the sort of the signature, they were essentially identical. We were seeing two images of the same thing. And it's all down to Albert Einstein. Essentially, the mass of this galaxy here is distorting, distorting the space-time around it. So light from here, which would have gone down below the galaxy, is bent round, so we see two images. It's called a double quasar. It actually gave us a way of measuring the age of our universe, or the, it's called Hubble's constant. I think we got 68, plus or minus quite a lot. And one of the best values we have today now is around 68, although there's some controversy about that. Um, that 
hopefully will be resolved before too long. So that's an example of what's called gravitational lending. We had a bit of a close call in 76 on the 2nd of January. Um, you know you had, well, no, you didn't know where you were, but in the south they had these terrible storms one year, and we had a pretty good gale and storm on that day, which nearly blew the telescope over. And so the following summer, they added these cross troughs, you see there and there, to help make the telescope a bit more rigid. Now some more astronomy. If you went a long, long way away, this is how our galaxy would look. It's a barred spiral. It's got a bar here and two major spiral arms. In fact, if this were our galaxy, we'd be about here. I don't know if you can see Norfolk or not, but it's about there-ish, actually. Hmm. And if you look at it from the side, we believe it has a central bulge of about 3,000 light years across and something like 100,000 light years from side to side. Some people put that number bigger now, and we're about 27,000 light years from the center. And this actually is a painting. It's, it's not a composite a photograph done by the Lund Observatory, showing all the stars in the sky. And here, of course, is the lovely Milky Way. I think you'll see it a lot better from Norfolk. And I say that because every twice a year, um, up at Kelling Heath, you may know of, they have the uh, Equinox Star Party. And I've been to that a couple of times. And it really is quite dark up there. And it's lovely to see. And just notice down here, we have the large and small magnetic clouds. We can't see this part from where we live. And over here is Orion, the hunter. Now we can make a radio map. I know the colors here are quite garish. Some things we see that the optical astronomers see. If you just quickly look there, that's a large magnetic cloud. And I go back, would you agree? It's still there. And the small one is there as well. And over here is Orion. And up here in Taurus, it's a little brightish spot there. If you actually look at that, uh, or have a, a high resolution radio telescope, you actually find something called the Crag Nebula. It's a supernova remnant that dates back from, I think, 1284. And it was called the Crab Nebula because when it was first drawn by the Thurl Earl of Ross, he thought it looked a bit like a spider crab, but I don't really see that. And in fact, I have tried to photograph it. It's quite faint, but I can photograph that from my back garden. Now, at the heart of that, there is the remnant of that supernova explosion. It's called a neutron star. The central core has collapsed down until it's about 20 kilometers in diameter. As a large object has collapsed down to a small one, it starts rotating very quickly, perhaps 60 times a second initially, something like that. It's a very powerful magnetic field, and this causes beams of mostly radio, sometimes light, to sweep around the sky, like an interstellar lighthouse. And if this works, we might just see that. So if, by chance, not always, the beam actually crosses our location in space, every time it does so, we get a little pulse of energy. And of course, they repeat very regularly. They're very good clocks. In fact, one of these objects is probably one of the best clocks we know of in the universe. And because of that, they're called pulsars. You've probably heard of that term. So I have to go like that. Um, the first one was detected by now Dame Jocelyn Bell at Cambridge. Um, it was oscillating or pulsing about 1.72 hertz, I think. And OK, you don't get sound signals coming, but if we take the radio signal, which in her case used produce little blips on a chart, we can apply that to a loudspeaker cone, which produces little clicks. And I hope this will work. This is the sort of sound in quotes that we get. Quite slow. There's a lovely one in the southern hemisphere, about 11 hertz, the Vela pulsar. The one in the crab pulsar, in fact, oscillates about 30 times, or spins 30 times a second, and we'll listen to that. A bit like a road drill. A road drill. Let me just go back briefly. Um, this is a sequence of pictures of the central part. You can see there are two stars there. The lower right, in fact, is a neutron star, which is not visible here. But as time goes by, it just begins to become visible. It gets brighter and brighter until here it's actually brighter than the other star, and then it dies away again, and the same thing over here. So what we're seeing is, in fact, the beam of that pulsar pointing towards the Earth. 
Now, we don't see the Milky Way terribly well from up here. Um, the Southern Milky Way, I photographed it uh, from New Zealand. It, it goes overhead. It's absolutely wonderful. And a lot of pulsars, because they come from stars, you find them in general along the plane of the Milky Way. So we built a 12-beam receiver. You can see it there being hoisted up to the focus of the Parkes telescope uh, at, uh, in, in New South Wales. And that was used to make a survey of the southern sky, the part of the sky we couldn't see from Jodrell. And all of those red dots there are new pulsars that have been discovered by that survey. All the black ones were the ones that we and others had discovered in the northern hemisphere. And amongst them, one of our students using a supercomputer at Jodrell Bank found that one of those pulsars wasn't one, it was two. Two of them co-rotating. It's called the double pulsar. And you can actually see them sort of going around there. One of them's not going around nearly fast enough, but that's the idea. Now, what's going on? Well, again, it's all down to Albert Einstein. He says that if you have two co-rotating massive objects, they will emit gravitational waves. In doing so, the system will lose energy. So over time, those two objects must gradually get closer together. And we can measure that very accurately at Jodrell. It's about seven centimeters per day. And the whole orbit is about the size of the sun. Just shows you what you can do with radio, doesn't it? Well, if they are getting closer and closer together, as we've shown, then eventually they're going to finally coalesce into one, probably forming a black hole. So I hope that works. This is a simulation. The green grid there is space time. You can see some ripples going out. They get closer and closer together as the two get closer because they start spinning around more quickly until finally they coalesce into one and you get a black hole formed just there and also a tsunami. I call it a gravitational wave tsunami that goes out. And there's the black hole forming down there. So that's what we suspect might happen. Not in this case, that's going to take a long time. But there are lots and lots of neutron stars out there, and hopefully this is going to happen fairly regularly. Oh, sorry, I've got to do this. Um, one thing that theory says is that a couple of seconds after the actual collapse, you actually get a burst of gamma rays. So we'll just bear that in mind for a moment or two. Now, you've probably heard of LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Initially, there were two of them at Hanford, and Livingston in America. And essentially, they have two arms, each of four kilometers. They have a beam splitter, a laser beam is split into two. They go up and down each arm and come back and they're made to interfere destructively, so there's no output. If a gravitational wave comes along, momentarily, one arm will get slightly longer, the other one will get slightly shorter. And hence, the interference will actually begin to come together and you get a signal and that's how you can detect gravitational waves and the one thing i, I did actually ask one of the people who's involved with this was um you obviously can't collect detect one if it comes straight down from above because it's going to go uh, through two arms identically and they'll both get shorter and longer uh, at the same time so you won't have any effect anyway that's a bit of fun um that's the hand of one um uh, it's actually in washington i'm sorry it's actually on the border of Oregon and Washington. I should have changed that. And this is the one, uh, there's one at Livingston. And also, very nicely, the Italians, who are great astronomers, have built one not quite as big. I think the arms are about two and a half kilometers long uh, near Pisa in Italy. It's called Virgo. And on the 14th of August 2017, two neutron stars merged to form a black hole. And there were detections at Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo. Now, because there were three detections, you could actually determine roughly where the signal came from, a bit of triangulation. By the way, this is the chirp. Can you see how as they closer and closer together, the oscillations speed up until you get that final, um, basically here, you've got the collapse into a black hole. And as predicted, a gamma ray burst was detected two seconds later by the Fermi spacecraft, a gamma ray spacecraft. So there, in fact, is the, the actual neutron star coalescence here. And there, two seconds later, is in fact the gamma ray burst. And that's rather nice. It shows that gravitational waves travel across the universe, as was thought, at the same speed as uh, electromagnetic radiation. 
As there were three detections, you could actually work out, roughly speaking, where it must have come from. It's right up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Essentially, every telescope in the Northern Hemisphere looked for it. Sadly, it, it, it was too faint to see with our Merlin array at Jodrell Bank, but they found out precisely where it was. In fact, it's 130 million light years distance in the galaxy NGC 4993. And that was actually quite exciting. And one thing that's come out of this is now a thought that a very high percentage of all the heavy elements are actually created in the fusion of two neutron stars to actually become a, a black hole. The amount of energy is such that you can actually create, we believe, all of these heavy elements. Um, one way of detecting a black hole is if it's in a binary system, because matter can be pulled from a companion star here onto the black hole. This is a star that's evolved sooner, more massive, and it's left a black hole behind it, but it's quite a big star. Its companion has then evolved and got larger, so mat material from the surface here falls onto the um, black hole. It spins round and round in the accretion disk. The friction causes the temperature to go up to millions of degrees, perhaps two million degrees, and you get lots of X-ray radiation. In Ariel 5, sorry, in 1975, Ariel 5 discovered the largest X-ray flare that's ever been observed, either before or since, and it came from somewhere within the constellation of Monoceros. And that is the flare there. And you can see it went up rapidly, if I can make the mouse go, on the 8th of August, 1975. Now, I can ask you, I won't be able to hear you, um, is what do academics at universities do in August? And the answer is they go on holiday. <laughs> and I hadn't. I was actually the only academic at Jodrell Bank on that day. And that's not because I'm a goody-goody. It's because in those days, not now, Macclesfield was a silk town, and we had our Barnaby holidays in June, a much better time to have a holiday. So I'd had my main holiday, and I was at Jodrell. I got rung up by Professor um, Pence from um, Leicester, who were running Aerial 5, saying, could we have a look to see if we could find out where it is? But they only knew, roughly speaking, where it was in Monoceros. And we got two telescopes, one the Mark II telescope at Jodrell Bank, and also we had a similar size one, uh, 24 kilometers to the southwest. And we'd, we'd made those into what's called a phase-stable interferometer, which was an exceedingly good instrument for measuring position. We made a scan of quite a large part of the sky centered on where they said they thought it was. I think in those days we, we had paper charts and the chart was about 20 feet long and they thought it was actually in the middle. We found it about uh, two inches from one end, so we were dead lucky. So we'd actually measured the precise position and that meant you could actually uh, observe the object. You don't see the black hole, but you see the star it's actually a companion of. And um, from that, from the precise position, that's it down there. And that's what happens. You get the black hole orbiting a star. You obviously can't see the black hole, but I had to make it light there. You can't see the black hole, but you can see the star. And you can measure how fast it's moving and its period. And from that, uh, we know what type of star it is. You can actually calculate quite easily that the unseen companion is about 9.7 solar masses, and that is a black hole. Um, in fact, I used to, be able to say that I helped discover um, the, 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 the nearest black hole to the Earth. It was about 3,500, well, it is about 3,500 light years away. But last year, one was found a good bit nearer. So I'm a bit sad about that. OK, um, just something else, a bit of fun. Around the millennium, we took part in what was called Project Phoenix, run by the SETI Institute. And uh, NASA had had a SETI program. It had been killed by uh, the Congress and Senate. Uh, the funding was taken away. Um, Jill Tarter went out and got private funding, and it carried on under the name Project Phoenix, rising out of the ashes. It was a dual telescope system. One telescope would pick up an interesting signal. Immediately, the second telescope would look for it to, to prove, really, to make an immediate collaboration, corroboration, rather, of what had been found. They started with two telescopes in Australia, then they used two telescopes in America. But in fact, before the funding had been cut, they'd helped fund an upgrade to the Arecibo radio telescope, which sadly, you may know, collapsed about a year or so ago. And 
they needed a big telescope to go with it. I happened to be at a conference sitting next at the conference dinner to their project scientists who said, we need a big telescope to work with Arecibo. I said, well, why don't we use a level telescope? That's what happened. And I was the project scientist in the UK. Um, the equipment came in 1998. We, over a period of five years, about six weeks a year, we observed 820 sun-like stars observed to about out to 200 light years, which is not a lot. No signals were detected. Well, of course, one reason is that the system didn't work. But every day before we started, we both detected a signal from the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. It was then about 10 million kilometers away, three watt transmitter with an antenna gain of a thousand. So that proved it would work. And that was about 10 times our detection limit. So we weren't doing too badly. Sadly, ET did not phone home. Should we be surprised? Well, not really. Look, 200 light years. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Unless intelligent life were incredibly common, we couldn't be very unlikely for us to have picked it up. Uh, I do give a talk about this. And my own view, sadly, is that at the moment, I think we're the only advanced civilization in our galaxy. But that's another story. Um, a little bit of fun. Just show what you can do with a small telescope. We set one up for use by our students and also those of the Open University. Uh, it's only seven meters in size. Um, this is a picture, uh, sorry, a, a telescope I used in Spain to take a picture of the galaxy M33 in Canis Venetici. And there it is. Um, and we know its size and we know how far away it is from Cepheid variable measurements. So we know how big it is. Um, so that's one thing. And this is a little seven meter telescope I helped design, or instrument really, at Joggle. And this is what we got, observing what's called a hydrogen line, a spectral line. Now, naught is basically the frequency 21 mega, sorry, 1400 megahertz that is transmitted by a cloud of hydrogen. And all this rubbish here is that from our own galaxy, which we've tried to get rid of. But here is the energy the spectral line coming from M33. And you see, it's, it's not just one simple line. The fact it's down here actually tells us the whole galaxy is coming towards us at about 175 kilometers per second. But this is broadened. This is coming towards us less, that's coming towards us more. The galaxy is rotating. And from that, you can calculate the mass. And it comes out to be 45,000 million solar masses. But we can also determine the mass of all the stuff we can see. It comes from the light to mass ratio we can measure in our own galaxy. And that's 8,000 million solar masses. So it appears there's five times more matter that we cannot see. We call that dark matter. So it shows you how easy it is just to prove that dark matter exists. And something that I was asked to put in by your chairman. Um, way back in 1958, the telescope was used to actually moon bounce, to send a signal to the moon and back. And I've got somewhere here, I think it was Hello Moon. I, I can't read, I've got the wrong glasses on, but I think it was Hello Moon. Anyway, on its 50th anniversary, it was thought it would be nice to recreate this. But there was a problem. Originally, of course, the level both transmitted and received, no problem. But here, they would only allow the level telescope to receive. And Muggins, because I was a radio amateur, was tasked with trying to organize moon bounds. Well, I knew that the best I could possibly do myself was to use CW, and I was loaned a, a nice powerful transmitter, uh, sorry, amplifier system, so I could transmit a couple of hundred watts. I bought myself a, a 19 element toner, and because I'm an astronomer, I had a, 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 a mount which I could then use to track the moon across the sky automatically. And I was able to use that in Morse. I, I got my Morse up to speed. That is the Swedish key that I used. Um, they were, I think, one of the very best keys you could possibly buy. Sadly, they stopped making them in about 2005. But I have it, I have it on a, a brass base there to make it very heavy. And I loved using that. I also have an iambic um, uh, uh, key as well, which I didn't like to use quite so much. So I got my Morse back up to that, and I was able to transmit signals via the moon to Joggle Bank. But they wanted to have some voice, and I was able to set up 
and some skeds with people all over the world, from Sweden, from Japan, from Australia and America, some of whom could actually send voice signals using SSB. And that was all a great success. I actually wrote this up um, for the RADCOM. I I'm not seeing myself now. I hope you can see me. But that, in fact, is the cover of the RADCOM uh, of that year, September 2007. And funny enough, it may link a bit with what was said earlier, that I had to go to the AGM uh, that year to get the award for the best technical article in the magazine. So that was really quite exciting and, and much unexpected. I have a nice little shield for that. I think your, your, your person there did something much better and has a lovely cup. Let me move on. Well, we're getting on towards the end. The level was really showing signs of age around the end of the 1900s. And we got a big grant from the Millennium Commission to upgrade it, to take the surface, really, to replace the surface. The old surface was in quite a state. <clears throat> it was removed. The backing structure was cleaned. And then galvanized steel panels were actually put on the structure, so they won't, in fact, uh, rust. And in fact, the whole surface has been given a lovely uh, two-pot epoxy paint, uh, and so that will not need repainting for quite a long time. There you see the work in process. progress. progress. This is actually on the 2nd of January, um, 70, uh, no, 2002, I think. Um, part had been done, this part down here. Um, part had been painted, that bit, and here every alternate panel had been done. And I know it looks terrible there, but that was at dawn, and the, the red light from the sun is making it look worse than it really was. But that's all the rust that was released when they took off the panels that had been replaced. And now the surface looks absolutely wonderful. And there you see it there. And here's a naughty picture I took with the moon as well. Mm. Um, I'm afraid I took the moon at a different time, but it sort of looks quite nice. Uh, a brand new drive and control system was added new drive motors to drive more smoothly. And in fact, I think a 10 computer system on the telescope structure to actually coordinate all of the motors to make it drive very accurately across the sky. I promise you that telescope is now better than at any time in its history. It can track more accurately. It has the much smoother dish surface, so it works at shorter wavelengths. And all in all, the receivers are vastly better. It's, it's the very best it's ever been. And in fact, it did actually have a, um, a, a final uh, upgrade um, about a year ago it finished. The old surface underneath the newer one was degrading, and that was replaced to make sure nothing fell off and killed people at our discovery center. Now, you've probably heard of the Lovell Telescope. You may well not have heard of Merlin. It's an array of telescopes that stretches across the UK. Um, I was one of its designers and builders in the, in the 70s and early 80s, and then upgrading. I was a project scientist for upgrading it in the 90s. And there are where the telescopes are. You see little pictures of them. The first of the new dishes we had was at Knockin, a little village uh, in Shropshire. And that's looking down from it from above. And I must admit, I had a lovely summer. It was a beautiful summer. Um, we were there commissioning it. It was the first of our new telescopes. Um, it's a very little village. It has basically a church, a pub, and a shop. And more recently, there's been a new owner of the shop. And he put up a, he put up a big new sign, <laughs> which you can actually see there. Oh, I, I, I thank you for laughing. I know there's somebody, I can't see anybody, so I know there's at least somebody who can see me. That's great. Anyway, um, if you put in the Lovell telescope, it doubles the collecting area, it doubles the sensitivity. It is one of the world's most sensitive radio telescope systems. Um, the Hubble telescope, I'm afraid it, this zooms in, I don't know how to stop that. Um, we have exactly the same resolution with Merlin at 5 gigahertz as the Hubble Space Telescope has in the optical. We have done a lot of work in collaboration with them, which is great. Um, this is the Hubble Deep Field, and we were able to measure the positions of all those galaxies. We couldn't see all of them, but we could actually precisely locate the brighter ones, and that means you can then lo locate all of them. And that was a great help to other people doing observations. Since 2000, we've upgraded Merlin. It's now called eMerlin to make it look posher. It is now very highly sensitive and high resolution. It's one of the I think the world's two most sensitive radio systems, the other one being the very large array in America. It's got more dishes that makes it sensitive, but it's not nearly so big. And a lot of work we do is in collaboration with them. We combine their data and our data, and that makes a fantastic entry. Um, and there's the Hubble Deep Field. We're actually looking at that now with eMerlin, studying individual galaxies that we can see there 
and seeing how they evolve. Um, some of you might remember, may not, that Betelgeuse, in fact, dimmed. It was Christmas time, not this one, the one before, I think. Uh, it may even be the one before that. Anyway, it, it dropped by about one and a half magnitudes, and everyone got quite excited. Was it going to blow up? Well, what we think has happened is it blew off a great cloud of dust, which obscured some of the light. And this is an image of Betelgeuse, taken with our Merlin E. Merlin array, showing you how it's not symmetrical. It's very unstable. And that is, in fact, the first star we believe that's going to become a supernova in the Northern Hemisphere. But we don't know when. Um, the telescope, the Lovell telescope, in fact, and our Cambridge telescope as well, and sometimes we put Merlin in too, has a major role in what's called European VLDI, the EVN, European VLDI network. Basically, we want to have even higher resolution. And this, I think, is the final example. There are a pair of galaxies, Bode's galaxy and the Cigar galaxy, uh, not far from the plough, actually. And M82, you see there, is called a starburst galaxy. It's producing myriads of new stars at its core. Many of them become supernovae, and they're ejecting a lot of material. Uh, uh, this actually looks red in H-alpha. It's excited hydrogen, and I can even image that uh, from a telescope in my back garden. So what is going on? Well, we know there are lots and lots of supernova going on, but you cannot see the core where it's all happening optically because of all the dust. But we can with radio. And if we combine, as I've said, Merlin and the VLA together, we can actually see all these bright blobs of supernovae and we can actually watch them expanding. We can measure the rate of expansion of the supernovae. We'd like to do better. And the way we can do that is to link our telescopes, three of them usually in the UK, along with telescopes <coughs> all over Europe, except in France. For some reason, the French don't seem to want to know, which I think is very sad. And I'm afraid I have to assume that the one in Crimea is not being used anymore, very, very sadly. The Italians are great. They had two, and they've now built another one here. So they're, they are wonderful astronomers, the Italians, and I take my hat off them. Uh, I think their economy is incredibly bad, but they managed to put money into astronomy and radio astronomy, which is great. Anyway, the world's largest um, telescope was um, is at Effelsberg in Germany. Uh, that's 100 meters in diameter, so bigger than our Lovell telescope. There's an array of telescopes in Holland, which is a roughly equivalent to our dish. So these are the three largest uh, in Europe, but there are lots of 60 meters and 32 meters as well. So it's a very sensitive system. It has the highest spatial resolution of any astronomical technique, and that's pretty impressive. Um, at each observatory, in the old days, we used to um, record the data on giant tape decks, you see here. Uh, and then it became a, a raise of hard disks. But now, it looks a lot better, doesn't it? Everything is basically transferred directly to be processed by optical fiber. And I should perhaps have said that the telescopes in New Merlin, uh, all the data comes back over optical fibers to Jodrell Bank, and we can actually transmit 30 gigabits of data per second from each telescope to be crunched in a thing called a correlator, uh, in, 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 a, in a Faraday cage, by the way, at Jodrell Bank. And that's where the data is combined. I can't find any pictures of how it looks now, but there you see as it was with all the tape decks all running together in synchronism. And what we could see as just a, an expanding blob with um, the VLBI, EVN, we can see structure. We can actually observe structure in a galaxy 12 and a half million light years away. And there's, in fact, a supernova that was picked up in 2009. That's with uh, E. Merlin. Finally, I, I made this plot a few years ago, and it shows how the sensitivity of radio telescopes and their rays have actually got bigger, uh, have got better over the years. Um, and I've started with the Jodrell Bank Mark 1 being 1. Now, of course, it's got vastly better, as I said. We're probably now getting on for 10. The Effelsberg dish was probably about 8. That must be about 15. And then the VLA in America was around 100 times. Uh, and that was about it. Uh, the, the big telescope Arecibo in, in, in Puerto Rico was even more sensitive. That, as I said earlier, sadly collapsed. Uh, the central part collapsed uh, a year or so ago. But the Chinese have built something called FAST, which is even bigger. And that must be the, the largest single dish in the world at the present time. And you can see that with E. Merlin, we've actually gone up 
to about, oh, I don't know, uh, not 10,000 times, but quite a lot more. And the EVLA, they've done the same trick. We use the same, the same correlator type as they do. They're slightly more sensitive, but smaller. Together, we are most, the, probably the best radio instrument in the world, I think, the combination of the VLA and, and, and the Merlin. We want to do better. You cannot really pay what well, any one country can't really do any better than it can now. So what we now have is an international consortium of about 30 countries that are working together to build what's called the square kilometre array because the idea is that the overall aperture would have an area of about one square kilometre. And that was proposed, in fact, by one of our professors at Joggle Bank a long time ago. Uh, the main part is going to be located in the Karoo in South Africa. That's where it is there. Very few people live there, so there's very little radio interference. We're a bit worried, by the way, about Musk's, Musk's, Musk's many thousands of satellites. And uh, that is going to be a bit of a problem. That's a, a sort of idea of how the central hub might look. Lots of 16-meter dishes. I think this one just looks right over the central core. Perhaps there'll be a thousand dishes in total, a few hundred to start with. And that will again make a very, very powerful and sensitive instrument. And that will be, in some respects, I think probably the most sensitive in the world and also with outlying arrays of telescopes all linked together something like a, a giant Merlin really that will also have very high resolution so that's what we're looking for now just to finish up with I used to take lots of pictures of the Lovell telescope I, I, I we, we, we had a photographer once but he got um, made redundant sadly um, as did our gardener, by the way. He ran off with one of our students, which would have been all right, except she was the daughter of one of the top people in the Science Research Council that funded us. So we didn't have a gardener, we didn't have a photographer. As my hobby was photography, I sort of did that just as a bit of fun. I took a lot of pictures from this location because the trees there nicely framed the telescope. I didn't know it was called this until I saw the plans for what, were to become, what was to become the headquarters of the square kilometre array. And there it is being built. And I think, can you just see those two trees here? That one and that one. If I go back one, yeah. I think it's that one and that one. Anyway, yeah. the point is you can no longer stand where I stood to take those photographs. So uh, I'm no longer immortal at Jodrell Bank, sadly. Um, here's our little observatory there. This is our discovery center. And I should just say um, it's actually having a major new building opened uh, on the 4th of June. And uh, it's going to be 250 feet across, the size of that telescope. It's a domed, it's, it's, it's a domed um, building uh, covered in grass. I call it the Teddy Tubby House. I shouldn't do that, but you get the idea. <laughs> and that will have a planetarium and lots of new exciting things. So if you're coming to Jodrell Bank, leave it till after June. Um, this is, in fact, a little 13-meter um, telescope we use to study the Crab Pulsar. Every time the Crab Pulsar is above the horizon, we are observing it except for one week in the summer when the sun goes in front of it. So there's us. That's the Discovery Center. Sorry, my, down here. This is us. But this here is the building of the SKA World Headquarters and the big building in the center as well. So we're totally dwarfed. But it does mean that the Jodrell Bank site has a role for many, many years in the future. I see no reason why the Lovell Telescope can't, being used, can't be being used for many years in the future, as can Merlin. So we keep our fingers crossed and hope the funding continues to see what we can do. It's still, I think, one of the world's best radio observatories, and I'm very proud to have been there for, I think, now 57 years. And finally, let me just say that uh, without Sir Bernard Lovell's vision, none of what I've talked about would have been possible. So it's him that you should thank, not me. But thank you very much for listening. There we go. So oh. I think I can probably stop sharing with a bit of luck. I can't well, do anything. Um, yes, click. That's okay. We've, it's fine because we've got your picture and things on a separate. Ah, that's separate, fine. So that okay. is great. Good. Well, you say we not thank me. We thank Bernard Lovell, but we do thank you. Oh, that's um, kind. It's of you. been a really wonderful talk. I mean, we are essentially here in this club, most of us radio amateurs, but it's interesting how many people are interested in the space as well. I suppose that goes, goes with the territory. Yeah. Um, I, I, I shouldn't probably say this, but I think this has been one of the most interesting talks in terms of talking about radio astronomy and linking it to our hobby. It, it's more accessible, I think, for certainly for me anyway. I, I, I will admit that we've had a few talks over the 
I don't know, 20 years or so that I've been a member of the club, you know, sometimes I've got a bit lost with it, but this has made a lot more sense. And, and so as well as talking about Jodrell Bank, I think that's probably helped um, explain it to a lot of people as well. So thank you very much for that, Ian. My pleasure. It's been enjoyable speaking to you. Yes, well, we've got some a few comments and yes, questions. Go ahead. But a go lot ahead. of people, by the way, honestly saying, and I can point you to the places where they're saying this uh, excellent talk and things like that. And lots of people compliment, so I'm going to miss those by, and go to some of the specific points. Yeah. I'll start with a controversial one that is uh, from north of the border. We have a uh, what we call our Scottish correspondent, because he used to live in Norfolk, although he's very Scottish, at 2M0RHT, Ralph. And he says, in the beginning, this is not really probably for a question, it's quite deep, but this is what he says. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then it exploded. Or is there a God who created the perfect and amazing eternal creation of eternity, past and future, which we have seen this evening in an amazing lecture, which demonstrates the glory of creation? My simple Christian faith tells me that there is divine plan both in eternity past and eternity future. That is my eternal assurance. You see what I mean? Very nice. Very nice too. <laughs> I, I like it. I think I'm not I, going to argue. No, I was going to say, I think that's probably safest. Thank you, Ralph, for that observation. Now, to get on a few serious questions now, uh, we've got Roger G3LDI, our Programme Secretary, who booked you for this uh, wonderful talk. He says, Elon Musk's series of satellites started collapsing a while ago. Is this system still going ahead? And does the space junk have much influence on results at Jodrell Bank? Good question. OK, well, uh, when he said it started collapsing, uh, 27 of his satellites um, were too low in orbit when there was a solar flare. And that actually affected the atmosphere and they actually um, deorbited down into the sea. So uh, that was a bit sad. Um, Yes, they, although they transmit in bands which are not the ones that we use, we have some bands that are nominally um, specified just for use by radio astronomers, um, it is a problem because every radio transmitter, as I'm sure you know, transmits away from the nominal frequency, even at very low levels, uh, and that can be a problem. Um, you would say, why on earth is the Jodrell Bank Telescope in, in quite a populated part of the UK. Well, in fact, there are many things that we cannot do now at Jogger Bank that we could, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, because of radio interference, and particularly mobile phones are a terrible problem. But the things we can do, there are two things we can do. One is we can observe pulsars, because we have what's called a match filter. You probably people might know that. You basically know exactly what you're looking for, and hence you can get rid of an awful lot of rubbish you don't want. So we can observe pulsars, and that's done with the level telescope. But secondly, if you have an array of telescopes like Merlin, for a signal to be a real problem, it's got to be coherent at at least two of the telescopes. And that doesn't happen very often. Uh, we try and make our receivers so they've got a lot of overhead that they can cope with fairly stark, strong signals, providing they don't get overloaded. So we do sort of survive. And I'm hoping that it means that the SKA can survive as well. But we don't really know yet. It is a real worry. So that's, I think, an answer to that one. I'm seeing two of myself now. I find that quite worrying. I'm sorry. Uh, OK. No, no, um, don't worry. Don't worry. It's all right. Well, we are here, I promise you. We do use yeah. Zoom, as I think we explained originally, a little bit differently to others. So yeah, you can't see worry. everybody. I, but they are, they are there. I can tell you about 70-odd people have watched this live oh, uh, in good. our club, which is a very good attendance Thanks. for us. And quite a few more questions for you. Paul Gunther, yeah. who's one of our Norfolk Amateur Radio Club members, but I believe lives in Poland now, but he, he watches most weeks. And he says, what camera does Ian use for astrophotography and has he had the infrared blocking filter removed? Oh, what a good question. I'll be ready because a lot of you won't know what we're talking about. Um, I do have one problem with standard DSLRs is that they actually cut out a lot of the red to make what you get with a DSLR look a bit like what you see with your eyes. But that, that lovely red color, that H-alpha, I mentioned that reddish color coming at the, the emission coming from um, M82, um, is not detected very well by normal uh, cameras. And so what you can do is to actually uh, replace the filter in the normal camera with a special one that lets that through, but actually it does cut out the infrared. We don't really want the infrared. It causes halos. Um, so I've got one of those. But I also do have, uh, I've got a couple of cameras which do not have that, but are very sensitive, full-frame ones, 
Uh, and I also do have a couple of, um, in fact, three cameras specifically designed for astrophotography, uh, and they don't have a filter at all. So you normally have to put in an infrared blocking filter, a UV IR blocking filter to make it work. But it's great fun with what you can do. And we now are tending to use lots of filters which just pick up the emission of HR for an H beta. A lot of objects, uh, they're called Planck nebula and, and, and things like the crab, emit at spe special frequencies. If we put filters on just to let those come through, we can get rid of most of the terrible light pollution we have. So he may understand that, but I don't expect many people will. That's right. Well, as I said, I think there are quite a few people actually interested in astronomy, including the lady, my wife, uh, Tammy okay. M0TC next to me, who's got a couple of uh, telescopes interested oh, as well. Excellent. So, so Lovely yeah, there's hobby. Quite, quite a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I write a, I write a, well, it's a blog. I've got about over 110 articles now, I think. It's called Astronomy Digest, and it covers all sorts of things astronomical. So that's, a, that's one that can be found on the web. Can you hear a pen scribbling away there? Because that's Tammy writing that down now. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ricardo asks, has the Ordnance Survey trigonometrical point S4227 on site been destroyed by the university recently? I have no idea. No. I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, uh, Ricardo, if you want, do you know what he's talking about? Because I'm afraid I don't. Um, or do, well, would you... I think I do know what he's talking about. I haven't been to Jodrell Bank for a couple of years. Well, because I have actually been, but not very often, and rather specifically. Uh, there was a, a, a trig point, I think that's what he's talking about, because one thing we can do at Jodrell Bank, we can find out where we are <clears throat> on the Earth's surface exceedingly accurately. And uh, using VLBI, we can actually measure the motion of the tectonic plates uh, around, which is quite something. So the answer is I honestly don't know. All right, well, there's some more research for you, Ian. I'm sure you've got enough yeah. to do, but there we are. Uh, Steve G3EVA asks, uh, says, great talk, very interesting. What is the frequency range of the Lovell telescope and how sensitive is the input? I guess we're talking maybe microvolts or something there. Well, I think I'd talk about nanowatts, probably. Okay, or nanowatts, okay. But yes, or certainly, yeah, I think we, me and Merlin will get down to nanowatts. Um, Lovell by itself, probably not. Um, the range... Well, we can go from normally 408 megahertz is about the lowest frequency we tend to use, but not so much now, really because of interference. Um, we, are, we use it a lot at um, 5 gigahertz around there. Um, we can use it at uh, shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, but the efficiency drops quite markedly. So if we want to observe at 22 gigs, we do a lot of work at 22 gigs, We'll use our Merlin telescopes, like the, the Mark II telescope at Jodrell, which we put a new surface on, oh, a long, long time ago. It's great fun. Uh, and that works pretty well at, at, at um, 22 gig. So the Lovell telescope, probably up to about 11 gigahertz, if that makes any sense. Thank but you. But we can go down to 408, as I said. We 408, up, okay. We could pick up uh, 432, four, or we, we use 408 uh, um, as about the lowest frequency we use. One thing, if it, it sort of linked to that, if I may, Ian, uh, yeah. one thing I pricked my eyes up particularly about was when you said that you felt that receivers have, have got about as good as they can get, uh, sort of physics-wise, I guess, is what you're saying. Yeah, and that, yeah. that was, I was intrigued by that, because I've never heard of anybody saying that, obviously, in relation to amateur radio or whatever. Are you talking about then the sensitivity or the, the noise that they, or, um, or what? Yeah, yeah, it, yes, it's, what's, how can I best describe it? Yeah, I mean, it's their noise level um, is now, I mean, we call them, as I said, to about 10 or 12 Kelvin, something like that. And in fact, I'm told, and I'm, I'm not an expert on receivers, that, that you really cannot do very, very much better than we're doing now. Um, you know, fundamental laws of physics get in the way, which I say is a pity. And incidentally, uh, we actually built some of the receivers for the um, Planck spacecraft, which you might have heard of which basically made a map of what the universe looked like all 400,000 years after the origin, from which we know an awful lot about the amount of dark matter and dark energy and the age of the universe. Together. So we we're quite proud. So we did, in fact, have one of the best receiver labs in the world, I think. I'm not so sure we're doing so much now, uh, but that's what we used to have. Thank you, Ian. 
Um, Jim G3 YLA, who says, wonderful presentation, Ian. Are special precautions taken in the electrical design of new buildings, re-interference, etc., and could amateurs make use of them? <laughs> well, there are two things. Um, computer systems generate a fair amount of radio noise, as I'm sure you know. Uh, the correlator, which is a very, very powerful computer system, we actually had it have in a Faraday cage. I mentioned that. So basically, it's totally screened from the outside world to stop the interference getting out. Um, we do have a microwave on site. It's actually in a screen box. So we use that to, to try not to cause any interference. And interestingly enough, uh, the Canadians, I mentioned that dish, the Parks dish, um, when we observe pulsars with it, um, they discovered a source of objects called peritons, where the signal uh, basically um, chirped, it, it changed frequency, it actually went from a high frequency down to a low frequency pitch, just, just doctor shifted a bit. And they studied these for quite a while, got quite excited. And then one of the students noticed that they were found most often at lunchtime during the week. And it turned out it was the radiation uh, from the microwave decaying as they opened the door. Oh no! So, we are, and in fact, when the last time yeah. we did a survey at Jogger, which was quite a few years ago now, we can't really do them. It was great because to stop all the noise from the computers, uh, we all were sent home for three weeks around Christmas time and had a lovely long holiday. Um, <laughs> so no. it is a problem. And yeah. I mean, we try not to get too many houses built close to us. That's the other thing, which can cause friction. But I have to say, the the the, the um, place called Holmes Chapel to the south of us has got a lot of building going on, and uh, we can't do an awful lot about that. Can I ask you a good, quite a diverse question? As a, as a scientist, though, and an engineer, I suspect, and all sorts of things, which means you... Is there... I'm trying to think how to put this. Is there something else other than a dish, do you think, that's waiting to be uh, invented, probably more accurately discovered, as a way of sensing this. I've thought this for a little while about the dish. It hasn't changed for, for ever, has it? About no, the way, I mean, is, is, is there anything else you think with the wonderful technological advances that we've made in recent years using solid state electronics and engineering? I'm just wondering, as you as, a, as an engineer scientist, you know, if you well, think there's another way that we could be examining. I'm not sure there is. I mean, you can make these um, flat phased arrays mm -hmm. um, You've got the phased array radars at Findells, for example, haven't you? Mm. That's a way of making the effect of a di big dish. Um, in a way, our Merlin is a phased array because we have to phase it up to make it work. Um, but I don't think there's anything you can do apart from having something, which could be a dish. It could be, um, you can have a grid at, at low frequencies. We actually use um, little wire, small wire things uh, instead at low frequencies. Um, but really, I don't think there's also anything very much else you can do. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not good enough. Don't know. No, well, beyond I'm not. My, beyond I'm, my pay grade. No, no, definitely not. It's just interesting talking to a scientist and an engineer who understands so many different aspects of it just to see if there's anything else out there that just might. I wish there was. Well, well, let's hope so. Uh, we're getting near the end now, Ian, but I want to leave it on this question, which actually we had somebody ask on BATC. I'm apologise, I don't know the name and call sign for this, but also a very similar question on uh, on Facebook. Uh, so the questions, that the, I'll, I'll read them both to you. They're very similar in that SETI has been searching for ion intelligent life for years. Do you believe there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? And Julian 2E0 DJR says almost exactly the same. Does he believe there could be life out there? So I'm going to leave that as our final question okay, to you. Okay, fine. Well, I say I, I do lecture on this, and I was part of what was then the most sensitive search ever undertaken for ET. There is a search going on at the moment. It's, it, this is interesting, actually. It's been funded by uh, one of the Russian oligarchs. So I wonder whether... <laughs> oh, dear. He, he, he pledged $10 million over 10 years. I think it's been running for about three now. So I'm not quite sure what will happen with that. Um, that is interesting. Um, look, there's a problem. Uh, we don't actually know how life arose on the Earth. It arose very quickly, virtually as soon as the Earth could support life. So that 
sort of implies, given the right conditions, it will happen quite often. So I'm fairly certain that in many places, even in our own, just our own Milky Way, we'll leave it at that, um, simple life will form. And there are already, we, we now, in fact, this year, actually, just a few weeks ago, the 5,000th exoplanet was discovered. And some of those, they're quite hard to find, are becoming a little bit like the Earth in terms of they are actually in what's called the habitable zone of their star. And they're not too close, which is a problem. Uh, anything that's too close gets tidally locked, which you don't like very much. So I'm sure there will be planets out there in our galaxy where simple life can arise. There are then two fundamental problems in my view. First of all, single cellular life has got to become multiple cellular life. There's a maximum size of a single cell. The bigger you make it, the volume goes up as the cube, the area as the square, and you just can't, you can only make energy at the, at the surface. You've got to get something inside the cell to make energy. I think they're called mitochondria. Um, it took a long time, I think two billion years, for multicellular life to evolve on the Earth. How often that happened, I don't know, but it took a very long time. So that's one problem. But then your planet has got to remain stable, at least in part of its surface, for long enough uh, with a sort of a temperate climate where water can stay as a liquid, pretty much, for life to be able to be sustained and gradually evolve. So that's the second thing that's got to happen. Um, the third thing that's got to happen, actually, is that we don't get too many impacts. Um, they can cause global extinctions. There have been about seven, I think, over the eons. And in most cases, um, very little life has actually managed to survive, but that's gradually evolved. And the great thing actually about these impacts, um, global extinction, is it stimulates evolution. We would not be here, probably, because unless the impact um, 65 million years ago, the Chicxulub uh, uh, event just off the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, Mexico, I should say, um, that basically got rid of the dinosaurs, the big things, and allow the little mammals to evolve into us. So if you had too many impacts like that, life wouldn't have a chance. And the great thing is that Jupiter, our giant planet, acts like a, a solar system vacuum cleaner, and it basically gobbles up most of the comets that might hit us, which is great. So a lot of things, oh, and the other thing, of course, is that we have a big moon, and that may not be very common, uh, and, and that's actually stabilized the Earth's rotation axis, and without that, it's possible, I think, the axis could point towards the sun. So one side of the Earth gets very hot, the other very cold. So there are a lot and lot of things that have been just right for us to be here. Obviously, they've got to be just right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. But I honestly do not believe they're going to happen very often. And as I think I briefly said earlier, although I think simple life might be very common in our galaxy, I think at the moment we may well be the only intelligent life form, if you can call it intelligent, I'm not so sure now, um, that exists. Now, of course, the universe is vast, there are billions of other galaxies. I can't say that intelligent life won't be anywhere else, but I don't think it will be that common. Is that, is that enough, perhaps, to say? I think inspired, mind-blown, everything to hear that explanation. Um, we all have our own feelings and our own faiths, indeed, of course we do. But I think that, that really does, it's very interesting to hear it from you as a, as I said, as a I scientist. I think we really are rather special. And of course, I just wish that we could look after ourselves and our planet a bit better than we're doing at the present time, particularly at present, of course. It's a bit sad. Incidentally, I did want to say I do love Norfolk. Um, I've had many holidays there. I've been to the Equinox Star Parties. I've stayed up at West Runcton, you know, in the north, mm, mm. and had lovely times up there. We were there in 76. Do you ever, anyone remember how hot it was? Well, I remember 76, we were, yes. We I were just... on the beach. There was a plague of, uh, uh, of ladybirds, which is wonderful. Um, my wife and I actually got engaged on the broads, well, on a, on a oh. sailing boat. We did lots of sailing on the broads with my, my brother and other people. And, in fact, I, I, I have a small 17-foot boat myself, and it has a cuddy. I had my son and a friend sleeping in there, and I, I, I basically camped in, in the cockpit, and we did some camp cruising uh, starting at Horning. In fact, a, a relative of mine was the vicar of Horning, so we used to tra trail our car to his house and launch it there. And there were some of the loveliest holidays I've ever had. And we have been across the Norfolk a few times since then. Um, you've got lots of lovely railways to see. You've actually got the rivers. 
I, I took my wife out on a motorboat from Potter Hyam and she got quite scared thinking I was going to hit things, but I didn't. Oh, that's lovely. Anyway, so I, I think you live in a lovely county and I'm slightly jealous. Oh, thank you. Well, we're jealous of you being on the doorstep of such a wonderful thing as the Jodrell Bank Telescope as well. Ian, it's been wonderful uh, to hear yeah. about the Jodrell Bank Telescope. I think it's the sort of thing that if you saw it and just thought, well, that, am, am I really interested in that? But you've made it so engaging, so interesting. Um, and I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to use your title, Professor Ian Morrison, <laughs> G0 DMU, diesel multiple unit or whatever. But we thank you ever so much for sharing this with us tonight. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and be nice with you and all the best to everybody. And maybe someday I'll listen to you on the airways. Well, by now, I'll, let's I'll hope probably so. leave you in peace and you can all make rude comments while I'm not, gone. Not at all, Ian. And okay. please, if you come to Norfolk again, I mean, our club is just starting to meet now occasionally as well. Yes, no, I remember uh, that. I'll so remember uh, that. please do that. You know, we meet every Wednesday night, either online or, of course, we're starting to meet in person. So it would be lovely to meet you in person as well. Very good. Well, all the best, everybody. Thank you very uh, much, Ian. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. There we are. What a talk. Really, you know, it's considering it's not, strictly speaking, amateur radio as well. I think that is uh, inspiring. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, look, judging by all the comments on BATC and on Facebook, you really, really enjoyed that as well. So thank you very much again to uh, Professor Ian Morrison, M0DMU. Just to quickly to tell you what's happening this coming week. On Sunday, it's the GB 2 rs News on GB3 MB at 7 o'clock. On Monday night, this, the Monday night net, 7.30 on GB3MB with Tim M1MIT and at half past eight, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. And next Wednesday here on NARC Live, we have Alan Walkey, a W2AEW, who's actually a professional uh, um, test equipment engineer, works for Tektronix in the States. And he's giving us a talk about the VNA, the, the Nano VNA in particular explains. So if you've got one of those little boxes and you're not quite sure how to use it because they can be quite complex, that's really one for you to watch next week because they're a wonderful thing to uh, analyse antennas and, and your whole antenna system. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. And oh, one other thing, please vote for Speaker of the Year. If you haven't quite gone yet and you're watching on BATC or Facebook, just click on that link and do a very quick vote, please, for all those people <coughs> who've given such wonderful talks to us in 2021. But that's it from, from now, from Tammy M0TC. Goodbye. And from me, David G7URP. Take care. We'll see you next week for NARC Live. Bye-bye.